I'm going to try and talk you through the endogenous growth model, but I'm not going to do the math. I actually spent 20 minutes doing the math just now, and then my phone died. <coughs> it's not worth it. I don't, I'm, I don't need you to know the math for this, for the exam, but I do want you to get a grip on how it works. Okay, so we'll see how far I get before the phone died again. So, remember in the Malthusian model, we had that uh, labor productivity grew exogenously as a function of the number of people. But in endogenous growth theory, we want to make that number of people we want to make the rate of growth endogenous. So it's not just a straight function of the number of people in the economy. It also depends on how much they choose to work in research. Okay. So how do we do that? What we do is we set up an economy with a bunch of households supplying labor and a bunch of firms producing products that are slightly different from one another. Okay. And we can see that in this function, which says that the total value of everything produced, big Y, is an integral of the different products raised to the eta, all to the 1 over eta. And what this does is, if all these Y's are the same, the integral just ends up being, if you think of the integral between 0 and 1 of yi, the integral is this area, you end up with just big Y is equal to yi. Okay, so in the symmetric solution, it makes no difference. But what this does is that it keeps each firm making one particular one of these products, a particular spike here, if you like. That individual firm has market power because if it cuts its production, then the price of its good is going to go up and it might be able to raise its profit. So, <coughs> this means, that's what this function does, okay, that if any one of these firms on this interval, I, from north to 1, cuts its production, it'll raise the price of its good, and it'll raise, may potentially raise its revenue. Okay. Of course, in equilibrium, all the firms sort of cut their production the same amount, and they all end up producing the same. But it still makes a huge difference. Okay. So, what happens? We've got labor supplied by the household. Some of it is spread between these different firms in production, but some of it is spread between research, and the research is specific to each firm. The firms each have different products. They all employ researchers to help improve that particular product. And why do they do that? It's because if they can produce, improve their particular product, they will gain market share and gain profits. Again, they all end up doing the same amount of research and they all get the same boost and they all end up with the same market share. But still, it makes a difference. And uh, I'm going to pause this and think about where to go. Okay, so to get a grip on this, let's do a quick thought experiment and assume that EDA is 1. Okay, 
then y is just the sum of the production of all the individual firms, and we do have perfect competition, which means that y is al a l y, but the wage, if we put take the first order condition on each firm's problem, they end up spending a l a l y on wages, and they have nothing left to spend on research. No research will get done in equilibrium, and there'll be no growth. But if we differentiate between the products a bit, what it means is that each firm, so EDA is less than 1, what it then means is that each firm is less keen to hire extra labour and raise its product, its production, because that will lead to a lower price and cut revenue. So that means that the workers are in a less good bargaining position and the wages will be lower which gives some cash over to pay for research, which is just as well because the firms are keen to do research to raise their productivity. Okay, so when there's imperfect competition, firms are less keen to buy labour, which leads to a lower wage and leads, creates room in the economy for research. The bigger the differences between the goods, the, the, the less, the lower ether is, the more research there will be in equilibrium. The equilibrium will arise when firms are making zero profits. Okay. I'm going to have a thing if there's anything more I want to say about this model. Okay, so what more do we want to say about this? Not much. So, you can do the math, it's in the book. There's nothing that tricky, but it's, it's going to take a long time. There's a lot of steps to go through. Okay, so that's why I'm not doing it, even on a video. Why is this not so important? This model is about the total quantity of labour. What we're going to be interested in later in the course is how firms allocate labour to different types of research. And we're going to use model with the same basic idea that firms are motiv motivated by the market power they have to do research, but they can choose between doing research that makes, for instance, labour more effective or it might make a natural resource more effective. And we're going to use some of these principles, but the modelling is a lot simpler. Okay, so I kind of want you to have seen this overall model for explaining the total quantity of labour, but you don't need to be able to work through it. But it's good if you've seen it when we get to the later models on the direction of technological change, the balance of what firms choose to invest in between different types of research. Okay, I'm going to stop there before my phone dies.